So now we have what? A bit of time? Um, well, the third part was going to be some uh, fun with oblivious pseudorandom functions. Uh, but I think 15 minutes is a little challenging. Uh, so maybe I'll give you one example where oblivious pseudorandom functions are useful rather than going for the introduction and then the generalities. So let me see if I can try to do this quickly. So this is, maybe you don't know what pseudorandom function or oblivious pseudorandom functions are, but it's okay. If I maybe run over five minutes, I'll tell you quickly. So this is work on uh, genomic privacy. So now one of my current interests. Uh, this is not the most recent work. This is uh, 2000, um, 2000, end of 2011, but I'm st still working on uh, follow-ups to this. So, um, okay, what is the, the theme is the brave new world that we are entering where um, human, and not just human, but gen DNA or genomic sequencing is uh, um, taking the world by leaps and bounds and the claim is that the claim I make, and I base it on conversations, uh, many conversations with uh, people in bioinformatics and genomics, computational genomics, that it's a matter of only five to maybe, well, let's say three to seven years or so until the price of fully sequencing a human genome will be around $100. Today, you can sequence your genome for several thousand dollars. If you want only the highlights of your genomic excitement, $99, right? Send them to 23andMe, lick something, and a few weeks later, you'll find out all kinds of exciting, self-involved things that you ever wanted to know, and then some. Uh, so, Genomics 101. Um, genome is the blueprint of us, right? It's the ultimate identifier. It tells you everything about the person, uh, well, almost everything. Uh, essentially, it's enough to replicate us, which is great. Uh, and it's the same holds not just for us, but every living organism from algae to elephant. Uh, basically, a DNA is a sequence, well, it's double helix, but it's really just, it can be viewed as a string of nucleotides from a very restricted al alphabet, Gattaca GTCA or ACGT. Human genome contains about 3.2 billion nucleotides, so it's a boring, boring, boring strings of ACGTs. That's it. Um, and it has uh, 23 chromosome pairs plus the mitochondrial, the maternal DNA. Now, sequencing is determination of the entire thing, right? This is the, actually digitization of the entire genome, the th entire 3.2 billion. Um, let's see what else. Let's quickly do this. So, the, whoops. So, the first time that it was sequenced, oodles of money were spent to sequence the first genome, right? Um, this in many, many years. Um, Again, as I said, it's foreseen that, uh, well, 2012 has already come and gone, and I think it's not $1,000, but like three or 4000 but give or take a few years, we're, we're, we're coming close to affordability of full genome sequencing. So don't be surprised if five years from now you, are, you can afford to do this, and so can your neighbors and relatives. Yeah, the cost was like $3 billion for the first one, and then it rapidly, rapidly plunged. Okay. Okay, this is more of the same. Let me skip this. Uh, no. So, great. Why do we need it? Well, because we're self-involved. We love to study ourselves, genealogy, right, ancestry, all kinds of bizarre stuff. Uh, mm, people can go to bars and compare their genomes and say, ah, we're going to have ugly babies. So, well, you know, uh, we're going to have Down syndrome children or um, we're just not compatible, okay? based on this genome. Forget the fact that, uh, you know, we've been making eyes at each other for the last hour. We're just not compatible, so let's not worry about it anymore. Um, or we are really compatible, so let's hit it off. So there are all kinds of recreational, but also more serious um, uh, applications, right? So, for example, you could sit uh, next to somebody and run a test that tells you if, they're, if that person is your father. Well, you can do it with your real father and see if, in fact, he is <laughs> <laughs> your father. Um, and all kinds of variations thereof. You can also do things like uh, more serious stuff, like uh, 
better medicine, right? So one of the uh, topics in uh, genomics today is, is or genomic related topic is something called personalized medicine. This is a very serious thing. It's a great advance. Basically, pharmaceuticals have invested tons of money into producing sort of these, not designer drugs, but rather these very customized drugs that treat awful things like certain cancers um, instead of applying sort of one cure fit all they look for certain specific markers inside your DNA and so if you have marker A in a certain position that this drug is for you if you have marker B then this other drug is for you so the, often there's a great variety of drugs and they basically recognize that certain types of diseases not just cancer cannot be treated by one drug fit all approach and this is the, the whole the notion of personalized medicine. So once DNA is digitized, doing sort of in silico or digital operations on ma matching DNA sequences much, much faster, much more efficient, much less error free, much more error free than doing it in vitro in the analog world. So why do we care about privacy? Okay, well, that's a Good question, right? We care about privacy because, uh, well, just you lose your DNA, you spit on the ground, and what do you know? Somebody can clone you in a minute, or five years from now, somebody you know, clones of you will be walking around. But more seriously, why do we care? We care because it's an ultimate identifier, right? Forget fingerprints or or iris scans. There's nothing more intimate or, or personal than a DNA, and. Um, it's one of those bizarre things, you know, there's an expression that says a gift that keeps on giving, right? Maybe you heard this expression. Well, DNA, or at least privacy of your DNA is like a curse that keeps on cursing. So imagine this, um, today you get your DNA sequenced, let's say in a hospital or, or just on your own, and then either inadvertently or voluntarily you leak it, right? Let's say you donate it to science, people do that or you decide to store it in some insecure location and a, vi a virus steals it, okay, or some malware. Well, not only have you just blessed yourself, because people can now, oh, say, well, figure out what color eyes you have, what color hair, if you're gonna go bold soon or not, you know, if, what, what kind of uh, genetic diseases you're predisposed of, that's fine, okay, that's you. But it also contains information about your parents, the whole ancestry, right, is, inherited, no pun intended, by your DNA. Worse yet, DNA today is DNA tomorrow. So you may be stupid today and you don't care about releasing it, but 20 years from now you're still alive and your DNA is out there and it's still cursing you. And it's worse than that. DNA tells lots of information, not about just your parents and you, but your siblings. So they'll hate you and your children that will curse you because born or unborn children, right? Your DNA is propagated to them. Not entirely, but large portions thereof. So if your DNA is public, lots of things about your children, again, whether born or unborn, can be inferred from it. So it's terrible. Um, but at the same time, we have these tests that could be, you know, these benefits from, from digitized genomes. So how do we reconcile the need and the, and, and the convenience of doing various operations on human genomes? Again, again I say human, but not just human. But uh, yes, of course, of course we do it using oblivious pseudorandom functions, right? Because we get the best of both worlds. So, and I should finish up soon. Uh, so all kinds of tests, right? Like these genetic tests for all kinds of uh, diagnosis and then compatibility tests, whether you do it recreationally or just uh, testing parentage or whatever. Um, tons of those. There's, this is not a new topic. Again, the, has been around people have in, in, the, in the security community. Some people in the database community have looked at it too, but a lot of work in, or some, quite some work in crypto and security, basically adapting uh, secure computation techniques to um, operations on genomics. And so it's, it's kind of a more of an engineering work because some of these techniques are quite general and adaptation is just a careful tweaking uh, to the genomic, to, 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 to make them applicable to genomic context. Right? So there's like string search for privacy preserving this, pattern matching, 
text processing and uh, CODIS test, uh, similarity or edit distance, and then Smith-Waterman scores uh, for compatibility or um, comparison of two DNA strings. Um, all kinds of other things. So what do we do here? Now, a lot of these tests can be realized with some privacy, but at some incredibly high, uh, at, at incredibly high cost. Because the amount of data here is 3.2 billion letters. This is not trivial. This is three gigabytes, uh, you know, of information on the orders of gigabytes. It's not something you can take lightly and just sort of uh, send back and forth several times without incurring significant delay. Uh, you also need to look into the actual domain. A lot of uh, optimizations, not just in, in privacy and security, have to do with the fact that uh, there's like 99.9 or 99.8 percent similarity between any two human beings. So a lot of times the DNA, individual DNA, is not expressed as a 3.2 billion letter string, but rather as a, as, a, as a set of differences with respect to a sort of standardized reference genome. And so it can be brought down to uh, some megabytes rather than gigabytes of data. Okay, so then plus there are errors. Da, 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 da. Okay, so let's look quickly. Um, yeah, oh, 99.5. So that's the, on average, the similarity ratio between any two human genomes. Parents and children, siblings have even higher similarity ratios. Identical twins. Anybody have an identical twin here? That's one interesting thing, because identical twins have identical DNA. How do you distinguish them? Anybody know? Just completely unrelated to this talk. No? How? No, it's the same DNA. There's no difference. Fingerprints. Turns out, I didn't know this, but found recently, even though two people have identical DNA, their fingerprints are different. Very different? Just different enough, apparently. Just different enough. There's not a lot of entropy in fingerprints, but they are sufficient for distinguishing identical twins. Okay, so we could just build a... So how do we do this kind of two, uh, a privacy preserving process? Let's say we want to do something really simple, like run a paternity test. Okay, so basically running a paternity test in the most general case re requires comparison letter by letter of two DNAs. Potential father, potential child, compare letter by letter, see what percentage of letters, position letters, match. We could do this using some standard uh, um, two-party protocol, uh, secure computation. We would get high accuracy and reasonable error resilience. The problem is that this will take a few days because, you know, if you do standard secure computation, and naively on the entire uh, DNA, that's very, very heavy. Is the Hamming distance really the right measure of distance? <sighs> According to the bind from, so, so I'm not an expert in genomics, by no means, okay? Total dilettante. What I heard is they claim it's the most accurate. Right? You give them the total saying, like, okay, there's 3.1 something billion letters are the same, and then so many are different. That, that ratio gives them somehow a, a very good measure of uh, parentage similarity, whatever. But in fact, that's not how, let's say, paternity tests are done. This, this absolute measure is, or Hamming distance is really a measure of similarity. It's not specifically, let's say, a paternity test. Paternity tests are a lot simpler. And uh, this is something. But yeah, so, um, we could just compare, you know, if 99.5% are the same, then 0.5% of 3.2 billion is much smaller. Why don't we just compare those 0.5%? Would be nice, but we can't, because we don't know where the differences occur. We. I have no idea. The biologists and geneticists don't know themselves. They don't know. They can occur in many different places. So it's impossible before looking at the exact two DNAs to, 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 to understand where the differences might occur. But that's a self-defeating privacy. If you look at them, then it's no privacy. So, um, so now we could uh, do this what's called private set intersection cardinality type protocols, which are a little more than specific. They are not uh, 
secure computation, you could use some kind of computational uh, uh, methods like RSA or Diffie-Hellman based uh, methods and essentially take, um, if you consider the DNA string, as, uh, you can look at it as a, set of, as a database, a very retarded kind of a database where each, each, each record is position comma letter, right, like 325 comma A, 527 comma G, right, so if you consider this to be a kind of a vector, you have two vectors you compare, or two sets, you compare the cardinality, right? You find out the cardinality of the set intersection, which tells you how many letters are in common in the same position. This takes a while, because even with fairly efficient techniques like RSA-based uh, OPRFs or Diffie-Hellman-based OPRFs, it takes a long time. But then, um, well, I can show you how it's done, right? This, this is, uh, well, this is a generic scenario. You have you have a server or, or and client or two, two, two people with, it, with their own DNA and you compute this kind of a set intersection. Um, the actual uh, paternity test is not done like that. In the lab today, what they do is that uh, when they, they have these sequencing machines and um, instead of digitizing or transcribing the letters, they look for certain markers in the DNA and they cut the DNA into certain segments and based on these markers. And what they compare, so they take two, two DNAs, right, the, the prospective father, prospective child, they cut them, and they compare the length of the cut segments, not the contents, the actual physical length. I know it sounds surprising, and it was to me, but then I talked to a few people and I said, well, look, there is statistically, the chances are, well, they compare enough, they don't just compare one segment to one segment, they compare like 30. They pick 30 segments and they compare their respective lengths. And if, let's say, 21 out of 30, at least 21 out of 30 match, then there's a high probability, the high, overwhelming probability that this is a parent-child relationship. Okay? That's, that's how it's done. So, and the accuracy has been empirically shown to be quite high. So we could do the same. Why be more Catholic than the Pope? Right? So we could do this, basically reduce this uh, technique to the use of this uh, private seven intersection cardinality, but not on the letters themselves, but on vectors of fragment lengths, which is a lot cheaper. Right? And basically, this is the idea. You compare the lengths rather than the, co than the, rather than the content. Okay, this is already mentioned. Well, okay, you need to pre-process the DNA in order to do this, but this takes, this is only done once. And actually, if you do something like 25 fragment-based test, then on, a, on, a, um, on an Intel it takes like one millisecond, sorry, two, 10 milliseconds in real time, which is noise. And when we implemented it on, a, on, a, on a Android uh, smartphones, it was marginally more, right? Well, marginally, okay. Remember, this is not a test that you do 100 per minute, right? This is to human beings doing this in a similar uh, physical setting takes less than one second on an Android smartphone. It's pretty fast. You can, extend, you can increase the accuracy by picking 50, let's say more than, rather than 25. You get a very small increase in accuracy, but uh, you know, the, uh, the timing goes up, by, so now it becomes a several seconds. Now in this setting, personalized medicine that I mentioned before, you can also use similar approaches, but now you're looking for specific markers. The setting, the privacy setting is different. In a paternity test, you have the prospective father, prospective child, they both have their DNA, they don't want to reveal them to each other, right? Because maybe they're not related, so they don't want to reveal. In a personalized medicine setting, you have pharmaceuticals that develop these markers. Recently, there's been a court case in the U.S. where they tried to patent certain DNA, DNA um, markers, denied. Consequence of that. Since pharmaceuticals that, I don't want to say anything good or bad about pharmaceuticals, but they invest tons of money into this. So if they invest tons of money into this and they cannot patent what they find, what are they going to do? They're going to keep it as a trade secret. Okay? They're going to keep those markers secret. Now if the pharmaceutical company keeps those markers secret and the patient does not want to reveal the DNA, what do we have? We have an impasse, right? You have to compare you know, a marker to a certain location in, this, in a patient's DNA. So you have, again, this privacy on both sides setting. 
and uh, a need for a secure protocol, two-party protocol. So, yeah, so all kinds of mutations and so on occur like this. Uh, let's see. There, we have a slightly different setting, no longer cardinality of private set intersection, because we are not interested in comparing fragments. What we are interested in is comparing a sub-sequence within a DNA to a secret marker. And the only thing we want to see is the outcome. Yes, there is a match. No, there is no match. I'll be done in like two minutes. Okay, so here we need what's called authorized private set intersection, where where the client here, the, the pharmaceutical company, uh, would get its marker somehow authorized. That way it cannot extract information from the patient DNA without some prior authorization. So it has to be certified by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, or some other agency. Anyway, I think I'll just stop here because I gave you kind of a taste, maybe not sufficient taste, of, uh, of privacy issues in, uh, in, genomic, uh, in genomic computation. Didn't get to cover OPRFs, but trust me, they're actually quite uh, fundamental to the protocols that I showed you, or tried to show you. Anyway, thank you for lasting the day and the afternoon. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>